Hi everyone, I'm Joanna Penn from thecreativepen.com and today I'm here again with Mark Lefebvre. Hi Mark. Hey Joanna, how are you doing? I'm good. And just in case anyone doesn't know Mark, Mark is the Director of Self-Publishing and Author Relations at Kobo and he also writes horror and dark humour under Mark Leslie. So that's super exciting and we're going, Mark you've been on the show before and of course I talk about Kobo a lot but we want to just start briefly, what is Kobo and what is Kobo writing life so everyone's on the same page before we get into the detail. Sure. Okay. So Kobo, uh, which is an anagram for book, Kobo is an ebook company that was born in Canada. And it's basically our focus is bringing uh, readers and writers together. Kobo Writing Life is a platform very much like Kindle Direct Publishing without all that exclusivity jazz. Uh, basically, we are there to make it easier for independent authors and small publishers to publish the work to Globo's, uh, Kobo's global catalog in 190 countries around the world. Yeah, and I think uh, as we record this, we've just heard that um, Nook is closing their UK operations after closing all the other global stores and is now, I think, US only or maybe US Canada only. Um, And so for me, it it is even more important for authors who don't want to be exclusive to be concentrating on Kobo and iBooks, which are really the other. um, Isn't it kind of you and iBooks are now fighting for second place? in America but in other countries like obviously in Canada Kobo is number one but in other countries there is only Kobo for example uh, yeah actually it, I'm, I'm surprised to see Nook back out of the global market because we're seeing growth in the global market it's continuing to expand so it boggles my mind that they would back out of these very uh, lucrative, um, very tomorrow markets, as you always say. I'm a big fan of your show, and and you have always been ahead of the curve in terms of talking about markets that uh, that haven't exploded yet. Um, so that's kind of startling. But yeah, it's it, it's it's more of a struggle with uh, iBooks international presence beyond the UK and in, in other markets. There are certain countries where uh, Kobo may may be the 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 most dominant player. So. Um, Lots of lots of great global things happening still. Mm, we'll come back to that. So I have picked some things out of the various news reports about Kobo, and I'll link to all that in the show notes so people can read the original. Um, Michael Tamblin, the CEO of Kobo, was recently in Britain at the Independent Publishers Guild and said, quote, the industry needs to let go of preconceptions about what the reader is and talked about the demographic of Kobo readers as uh, silver foxes with over 50% over 55 years old and 30% retired. Now, I'm fascinated by this. Um, What are your thoughts on this demographic and, you know, anything else you can tell us about the demographic markets on Kobo? Oh, sure. Uh, I mean, we love our readers. Uh, we, we, we spend a lot of time paying attention to who they are. And, and it's kind of interesting when you think about that uh, older demographic, because there's something about that time in their lives where they actually have more time. In in some cases, the kids are growing up or grown up, or they're not very young anymore. They have more time for pleasures, and so we're we're competing with television and movies and th- things like that for their leisure time. But they have more leisure time. The other thing, as the Kobo Red Life guy, that really appeals to me about this demographic, and it leads back to what I. What I what I preach to indie authors repeatedly is that these customers are not as sensitive to price. Mm. Time is of the essence. So what they want is a great read. That is their primary concern. They're not digging through the bargain bins looking for ninety nine cent novels. They're looking for entertain me, give me good value. So this is an opportunity for writers, uh, specifically with Kobo, to 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 focus on the quality and making their product the best it can be, making it look the best it can be, even if it is the best it can be, that's where your blurb, that's where your synopsis appeals to that aspect of the customer. And and of course, um in 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 certain territories you can you can talk about higher prices and things like that. The other thing I wanted to comment on that because I think it's important is we're starting to share some reading stats on uh, the website as well. So, I mean, just before our call, I was looking at some of your books on Kobo and looking at the reading stats. So, the reading time, you've got a London Psychic box set. And 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 so, 
giving based on reader um, um, consumption of the books and based on the on the word counts we can estimate for you how long it takes the average person to read the book so i'm going on an 8 hour flight will will this box set satisfy me yes the london you know if you're going on an overseas flight you got to pick up the 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 um the london psychic box set cuz that will fulfill you the whole time unless you're a really really fast reader then you got to buy the seven book arcane um but but that's the kind of thing that's really to me as a reader I do that all the time. I pick up a book and I wonder, is this going to hold me for the whole flight <laughs> or for the whole time I'm away? How many books am I going to need? Mm-hmm. And so we're starting to display those and we're starting to provide more uh, reading stats as well. So one one of the examples for reading stats was um, like the average Kobo user has enough books in their library that uh, like it'd be like 56 pounds of books if it were paper or something like that. So, <laughs> Yeah, and I think I, I like how you guys share your statistics. Uh, you know, obviously we don't hear from some companies around their statistics. The other thing I'd say, obviously with the, um, I mean, a lot of people were saying at the moment, oh, young people only like print and that means they're going to carry on with print. But I, I get the feeling that younger people like, you know, I buy print books for my um, nieces and my godchildren and all that. And they want print because one, they don't have a credit card card so they don't have the one click buy but also they don't you know they they want to have physical things because they don't own many physical things because their parents own most things so I think what we'll see of course as those young young people get older they'll also move into this demographic anyway and also with Kindle like with my mum she turned uh, not just Kindle with Kobo sorry with e-readers with phones with everything you can change the font size and that's a massive thing isn't it as people um well just it's not just older people I can't I can hardly see yeah for sure <laughs> well when you're tired too right at the end of the day you you're probably reading on a screen if you're younger you're reading on a screen all day anyways um and that's the thing is i mean i've been in the book industry for long enough to remember a time when People would come in looking for large print books, and A, 10% of the books were available in large print, and B, they were 10 to $20 more expensive than the hardcover, even mm. if they were in trade paperback, because, well, they take more paper, and, 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 they're, and they're harder to produce, they're harder to uh, afford. In digital, every book is a large print, and every book is whatever font you want it to be. You know, uh, Kobo, Kindle, Nook, iBooks, all of the major players have multiple fonts so you can set your own preferences for how you want to read that book that's an amazing empowerment for the reader Mm. i just remembered one thing doesn't kobo have a waterproof uh device you can read in the bath oh my god so uh, the bath the beach the bed anything that starts with b you can read in it so it's the uh well no yeah kobo aura h2o which uh, we launched uh, in Michael Tamblin uh, in the pool with the synchronized swimmers. It was an absolutely <laughs> amazing event. Uh, and and it's great because it's not just, yes, the bath is great, but you take your, your reader to the beach. It's not just the water you're worried about. It's the sand. But mm. a waterproof device takes care of that. And so um, that is now my go-to device. I used to have the, the older version of the, of the Glow, and now I've moved to the H2O because – I spill my coffee or my water on it you know it's it's a simple matter of wiping it off and we're good to go yeah okay so I want to come back on the um the box set thing because as you mentioned uh this is something I've just done this week is a seven book box set uh of my arcane my existing arcane series and I've got book eight coming out and book the, at the end of the seven books it has a link to the pre-order um when this goes out it might be available but um the aim of that was so uh, because on Kobo my box sets sell better than my individual books um which is super exciting so I wonder and and okay just to explain for other people you can do higher prices than 9.99 on Kobo which means that you still get the higher royalty rate which you can't do on Amazon you can also do it on iBooks but you can't do it on Amazon so there's I won't even sell that box set on Amazon at the moment it's only on Kobo because I know Kobo readers will pay for that so what it, what are you seeing around box sets and and why should authors give it a go because a lot of people can't see the market for it or they think it's about discounting the the box set is a great value for the consumer because you can get 3 or 4 or 5 
or six books from the the the, the author without it costing as much. So it is a good value, but it doesn't have to be a giveaway for the author. Uh, when we wanted to remove the cap, so it, it actually stemmed back to, I, I approached Michael Tamblin and said, we, we had $1.99 to $12.99, and, and, and industry stats were showing that $1.99 was a really bad price point. And I said, listen, I don't want to encourage people. We can afford to give them 70%. But I don't want to encourage them to price their book at that price because they'll be twice as likely to sell it at 99 cents and four times as likely at 2.99. I want to walk that up, but I'd like to walk up 12.99 to 15.99. And he said, "Why do we have a cap in the first place?" And the answer was, "Well, because that's kind of what Amazon did, and we we just wanted to be better than Amazon." And he said, "Well, why don't you just remove the cap?" So it was his brilliant idea to just remove the cap, and that opened up. A whole new opportunity for writers because some readers uh, are used to binge watching, right? Mm. They they watch a whole season of something on Netflix, and so they want to binge read. They want to get all seven books. They don't want to have to go back and pick them up. They want to just say, "Listen, I'm going to read the entire Arcane series. I want them all now. Give them to me, please. I can take them on vacation. I don't have to worry about Wi-Fi. I've got them all loaded and they're good to go, and I get a good value." Mm -hmm. um, and so I think it was Lauren Royal was the first independent author. She's a historical romance author who did a box set that was $19.99. And by far, she surpassed everyone that month. She was knocking it out of the park. And the beautiful thing was she was making almost, you know, almost $20 for every unit sale, not $0.30 cents or, or whatever, the, whatever the, the thing is that you normally make when you get a huge volume of unit sales. So it has been a really, really... Um, good experience for um, for our authors. Mm. And I think the other thing is, uh, you know, a lot of us now doing Facebook advertising. Uh, and when you do Facebook advertising to a box set, it's pretty much the main, the only way you can get positive ROI on an advert. So what, and I'm only three days into this so far, because I only put up the box set this week, the seven book box set. I had three, three book box sets, but this is the first seven book. We're st we've started advertising and so far we've had a positive ROI. So, you, so we're making money on the, you know, on the books. The books are, are kind of doubling the price of the ad. So that makes it really worthwhile. I'm only doing it in Canada at the moment and we're just testing it out and then we're going to roll it further. So when you have a higher price box set, I think that one's $14.99 or something, but you know, it, it's a big you know a big buy so you get really good return on your money so anyway that's what I'm looking at and by the time this goes out uh, as an interview I'll be able to update in the introduction um, you know what was going on with that but I think that's a good reason I did want to ask you because it's interesting the 3d effect uh, covers for box sets versus the flat cover Kobo has a view on this yeah, I, and I, the 3D covers are sexy. I like them as myself as an author. I think they look neat, especially if you're a digital only author. This is your chance to see the book, how it would look if it were a hardcover. But the reality is, is our merchandisers uh, who control the show, um, our merchandisers and our customers in many ways, so long as the cover, uh, they, they like the flat, the 2D cover, so long as the book shows the value of the multiple books. And I think the, the, the covers that you've done for the Arcane and the London Psychic are very clear. We know we're getting value. We know we're getting more than one book. And you can see very clearly what you're getting in that. So, so long as that value is clear, um, customers are fine with it. And it also displays better. You can actually see more of it because you're using all of that real estate because that's how the that's how the promos and emails are built. They're built using that you know, that rectangular uh, real estate. So that really enhances that thumbnail to be a lot more visible to the consumer uh, mm -hmm. and it's less confusing. So we found that that helps increase sales and that's why when we're running promos, we, we have a strong, strong preference to include uh, 2D covers rather than 3D covers. Yeah, and of course, uh, iBooks, you can't use 3D covers. So there's got to be something there that's, you know, if two two major um, sellers are saying we prefer flat covers, that's got to, you know, it's got to prove something. There's uh, got to be a reason there somewhere, some <laughs> yeah. some hidden reason that maybe they sell better or something. Yeah, exactly. I, and I've actually swapped one out on Amazon. If the trouble is you can't split test. I mean, you can see, or you can see your data. But one can't split test on one's own books. Um, but 
but I have now put one of my box sets as flat on Amazon because I think people on Amazon, people have uh, used the multi-author box set, uh, you know, as I did with um, other authors to get on the New York Times list. The multi-author box set for 99 cents, you know, 12 book 99 cents. That's what people uh, is in authors' heads. But as you've said, in readers' heads, they see a single author box set as more like a, a value and a binge read. So I want all people listening to completely disconnect the cheap multi-author box set with the mega value box set. So let's come on to merchandising because of course that's the other reason because Kobo merchandisers obviously make money on selling books and they prefer to give the reader a good deal and make money. So they're more likely to pick up a $14.99 um, reduced to say $8.99 than they are a... Two ninety nine reduced to ninety nine cents. Would would that be right? How how do the merchandisers sure. see these things? For sure, we want to show value. So think about the way BookBub approaches. the The bigger the discount, uh, the the bigger the deal. We can share that this is eighty percent off, not fifty percent off. And again, eighty percent off of two ninety nine to nine ninety nine cents is nowhere near as exciting as you know a box that that was you know north of fifteen or you know, close to twenty dollars coming down to two ninety nine. Now think about it from this perspective as well. That drop from fourteen ninety nine or eighteen ninety nine down to two ninety nine does two things. It's a huge value for the consumer, but it's also still giving you seventy percent at the low end. So I mean, it keeps more money in your pocket, and it gives a very visually representative um, a drop. Now we do show the price changes on the daily deals page. We actually have a new deals page that shows all the deals. But it also is something that we have done some A-B testing with and we show that when someone just changes their price, showing that price change really does increase uh, the consumer's um, willingness to click that buy button. So we'll be doing more of that. So even if a, an author isn't in a, in a promo, if they're doing a temporary price drop for whatever reason, we'll be showing that because we want to show the consumer the value. And of course, there's, there's something about the... Um, the urgency of Daily Deal saying this is only available for a limited time at this great price. Mm, absolutely. So uh, one of the other stats I saw is that writing life self-published titles account for 15% of all the books Kobo sells. Uh, of course, many authors still choose KDP Select and exclusivity. Um, and of course, I bang on about not doing that. Um, but they, oh, some people say that they do that because they didn't get any traction at Kobo or iBooks and we'll forget about Nook for now. So what are some of your other tips for helping people sell more books on Kobo. I know this is going to sound very self-serving, but it's the reality. And 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 I think I I I think I am honest with authors about what's good and what's not so good. Um, the big sellers, the people who are doing really really well on Kobo, tend to be the people who don't dip in and out. And and I'll tell you why. Mm -hmm. um, it does a couple things. We we have a thing called temperature, which you think of as, which affects the ranking, which affects the also bots and all of the algorithms that feed our system. And titles, it does take longer at Kobo. It takes six to nine months to get any traction on Kobo. It's not an easy game, um, nor is writing, nor is <laughs> publishing. So it's very much a realistic uh, marketplace. But once you get traction, it it slowly builds and it slowly builds over time. So authors who keep dipping in and out are not making it any easier for themselves because every time they come back after their three-month tour of duty with KDP Select, they have to start from scratch. Their temperature goes right back down to zero. So every time they do that, they're not getting any traction. The The other thing I think... And, and I'm seeing more of this over time because we have our um, people who pay attention to our core readers and our, and our core um, and, and issues that they have. And it gets brought to my attention that an author or a reader was reading books from an author and then they found out that the author had a new book and – and that new book's not available on Kobo. Oh, no, sorry, you have to wait. You know, We reach out to the author and find out they're in KDP Select. So we, we have to apologize to the c consumer who blames us and to say, oh, sorry, that book will be available in 90 days because the author is participating in, a, in, a, in a, a, something with another retailer. So that's really frustrating because that, that customer who wanted to buy your book may not wait around 90 days for you, mm -hmm. isn't going to go buy it on Kindle, 
they're buying stuff from Kobo religiously. So they're just going to move on to, to another author and then it hurts you even more. So it's this self-fulfilling prophecy um, that is I, – I just see it as – as, as as negative a spiral for indie authors as being a mid-list author in traditional publishing has been over time, right? It's just a negative spiral that keeps going down and down and down and down and down. Um, I, I, I think the, the authors who do really, really well also uh, include Kobo in their promos. Not, not feature it, but include. So when they share information, they share all platforms, and that gives their readers an opportunity to to buy it on whatever platform they're already on. And, that, and that's a key ingredient. It's a small thing that people do, but um, the authors who are successful do it. Mm, so that would include, for example, doing an email to your list about your new book, and you would include all the retailer links as opposed to just the Amazon link. That, exactly. Or on your website, including the links to your Kobo link as well as your Amazon and other links. Yeah, all the links to all the retailers so that the consumer goes and gets it wherever they are privy to. Yeah, and I think I, I would agree with that. And I'd also agree about the time. Uh, you know, these things do take time to grow. And, you know, I do often say to authors, you know, if if you're still new, like if you've only got one or two books, then fair enough. You, you're just getting started and maybe exclusivity is a way to go. But once you're taking this seriously as a as a career, you know, going wide and going on multiple platforms is the best way to protect your multiple streams of income, right? Because you never know. Um, and, you know, I'm very happy with my Kobo sales, but it took a while, right? I've been on since day one, I think, like you have been, 2012, yeah. but probably my sales were about $3 in, in, the, <laughs> in the first month. But so they were on Amazon at the beginning, you know, so I think that's important. As you say, it's a long term game. Well, imagine you were an author who made the majority of your income from Nook in the UK. What would you do right now? <laughs> yeah, you're pretty Thank pretty God you have Kindle and Kobo and iBooks. <laughs> yeah. Right? Exactly. Yeah, exactly. I wanted to just also ask you about uh, pre-orders because at the moment it's so funny. I just had um, someone email me because I have a pre-order on Destroyer of Worlds and I have done for months um, on Kobo iBooks and through draft to digital on Nook and uh, other platforms, but not on Amazon, because on pre-orders on Amazon seem to be a pain in the neck in terms of ranking, but also, you know, they have a 90-day thing, blah, blah, blah. And so you guys have a much more open pre-order thing. So what, what are your recommendations with pre-orders and, and how do they make a difference? Well, I think pre-orders uh, build your catalog earlier. And so if a customer has finished one of your books, and whether it's in a series or whether it's standalone, if they finished one of your books, they want to see what else you have. So that gives them an opportunity to, to commit to buy now, give your credit card, and then when the book is available, we'll give it to you. And hey, when you have their eyeballs, you want to hold their – You want to when you have their eyeballs, you want that to – thing to a credit card and, and, and get the sale from them, right? You don't want it just to be eyeballs. So that's an important factor. The other thing, it's also, it's kind of part of the SEO. Sometimes people, when they, when they want, if you only have one book out and the other book's going to be available in six months pre-order, that just shows that you'll be around to entertain that reader. Uh, I know agents, it used to be a thing uh, when, when you were pitching to an agent in traditional publishing was the agent's not just interested in the book you're pitching. They may ask you what your next book is going to be, and you better have an answer for them because they want to build a career, not a book. Mm. And, and that kind of is what readers are doing in many ways is, well, do I want to read this author or do I want to discover a whole new world that they're going to bring me into? And, and that's part of it. So it helps in that aspect. And I have to apologize because we allowed pre-orders, but we didn't have the mechanism to show you your pre-orders because we don't the, – the dashboard currently only shows sales – after we take in the money. And so two things we're going to be fixing in our dashboard in the next few months is actually giving you the ability to show pre-orders. Believe it or not, the, U the UX, the user experience for that is, is, is a lot more complicated than it would seem because when it moves from pre-order to sale, where do we show it? How do we show it? Do we have a map with a toggle that only shows pre-orders? And so there, there's, it's, it's a lot more complicated. And then of course the free as well. Um, uh, the free tracking has been broken. The objects in Mirror are larger than they appear currently. And so chances are if you're seeing 50 free downloads, you really have 100 free downloads because of the way that the different systems that they're pointing at. Um, so there's a few 
uh, enhancements coming in the dashboard that will allow you to see free and to see pre-orders in the same rich way you can see sales uh, with a few more options. So that's sort of an apology to existing Cobra Writing Life users and, and, and a promise of what's coming in ter- terms of making your visibility on your pre-orders um, a lot more prominent. Mm. So what is the benefit of using Kobo Writing Life over a, um, a distributor like Smashwords or Draft Digital? Well, I think one of the the big ones, uh, and this 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 goes more probably for Smashwords than Draft to Digital, is global pricing. Uh, you really to leverage Kobo, you can't just stick in a U.S. price and 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 roll the dice and see what happens. You really have to look at the global market. You really have to specify your global prices. Most of our authors, fifty percent of their sales are. Canada. So why aren't you optimizing your price in Canada, Australia, New Zealand, walking the price up a dollar or even two done because the exchange rate is scary, and, but walking it down in, in, in pounds and walking it down in uh, rupees, which very shortly, probably by the time this podcast airs, that will finally, that was another UX nightmare. Uh, we had eight currencies you can control and mm. we're moving to 17 currencies. So <laughs> The, the 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 challenge there is is how do we show it to people without overwhelming them? Mm. How do we give them the ability? And and I think Draft to Digital did a really good job of this. They had the pop up window, and so with ours it comes. It's not just the pricing, but then how in the promotional, uh, in the promotional pricing where you can set your price in advance and forget about it. That you set it, walk away, come back after your book bub, and not have to sit there at midnight and press your prices. So functionality like that is uh, is helping authors. And then, of course, the, the, the promotions tab. We have a, a promotions tab available for Kobo Writing Life authors, which is, which is still in its early, and I call it the beta phases, because there's still a couple bugs to work out. So users who are in it, we usually open it up if we know the user is going to be patient and or will provide us feedback that helps us make it better. Yeah, and that has been fantastic because previously, you know, there was a lot more manual work on your end as well to try and sift out things to promote. But now, um, you know, those people and eventually I'm sure it will be everyone gets access and you can submit your own books. So that will help you guys because you don't have to kind of manually sift through everything. Um, And also I I found it really easy to use to to schedule these various promotions. So that's been really cool. Wanted to ask you about um, you also have this uh, author services tab um, which yeah. includes print yeah. on demand and there's been a <laughs> survey about print on demand uh, yeah. what what's happening with that um, uh, you know are you looking at, cre- at competing against create space and in in what <laughs> markets for example well I don't I don't see Cobo writing life competing with create space um, what we're really doing is we're offering yet another option for authors it's kind of um, Author services was born out of, just like the promotions tab was born out of, the the biggest question we got from authors was, what will you do to promote my book? And the biggest challenge we had was how to manage those requests and how to, because we have a thousand requests for a hundred spots, how do we manage it in order to give our customers the best possible books, but give our authors more opportunity than before? So I call the promotions tab uh, book bub built right into writing life. Um, with the author services, there's so many authors who ask for print on demand or ask for can you recommend an editor or where can I buy an ISBN or where can I get audiobooks, all of these things. And so over time, we have met and encountered so many amazing people who offer services. The challenge is how to, how to properly move people over. And the biggest challenge I have is 90% of the industry are sharks who are preying on the hopes and dreams of writers. And so our desire is to help steer new writers who don't know what they're doing and don't listen to this amazing podcast and other resources that are available, but most writers don't. So how do we steer them towards trusted services? Uh, And I'll give you an example. ISBNs. You don't need an ISBN. Nobody needs an ISBN. But there are some authors who really, really want a print book and therefore want an ISBN or want to have an ISBN. Mm. So, you know, for those authors who want it, it's there. And we make it easier so that they don't have to go wandering and maybe fall into some rabbit holes and maybe spend way too much money that they don't have to. Um, In terms of print on demand, to to come back to that, uh, and the reason why we're looking at it in such detail is – 
the biggest challenge with CreateSpace, which is a fantastic service. I use it as an author myself, but I also use Lightning Source directly. And I know, having been a bookseller for over 20 years, that 98% of booksellers will never order a book from Amazon. Mm. Uh, not because it's not returnable, but the terms are horrible. It's a bad experience, and you're stuck with the book. With Lightning Source, you can set up, for example, the ability to make it returnable, which costs you a lot of money, which is publishers eat that cost all the time, um, which makes it more likely for bookstores to carry your book. So having used print, other print-on-demand services as an author traveling, calling three months in advance, and this was even with Barnes & Noble years and years ago, because uh, remember, I was in print on demand in 2004, back in the really <laughs> archaic or ancient days of digital. Um, I would call Barnes and Noble and and say I'm going to be in town. I'd love to do a signing. They look in the system. They see it's available and it's returnable. So they're less likely to say no. We have no idea who you are. No, and they did it. Um, so uh, giving more op- options to authors uh, is really what it's all about. So that's something that we're really intrigued with. Just so people listening, Lightning Source now people go through Ingram Spark. So uh, you know Mark's old school, <laughs> <That's> <laughs> but, right. but they have changed it now. Um, so other things I wanted to ask you about. We're running out of time, but you know I have these other questions. Um, first of all, in March 2015, Kobo acquired Overdrive. Can you explain what that means to authors and readers? Uh, hopefully this year. Yeah, of course, uh, for sure. So Overdrive basically powers audiobooks and uh, print books to or print digital books to libraries primarily in North America they have a huge presence but they are growing globally and this is this is a great way to get into libraries now I know indie authors already had ways into libraries but unfortunately in the past all it really was was um, they took a whole bunch of self-published titles and they dumped them into the library system and they ended up in a, in a ghetto mm-hmm. a self-published ghetto so from the time that we started to work with our colleagues at um, Overdrive, um, we've been providing them curated lists of what are not only the best-selling titles from Kobo Writing Life, what are the best-selling titles in each category, because librarians have very specific desires and requests that their sales team use, but then also, what are the best read? Because that's another thing we do is, this book may not have sold thousands of copies, but all 10 people who bought it read this book cover to cover in the first day they picked it up and opened Mm. it. They couldn't put it down. Therefore, you may want to pay attention to these titles. And then the other thing librarians are very interested in is local authors. So promoting and supporting authors who are local. So so working with the uh, the publisher acquisition team at Overdrive, we're we're in the process of developing and testing. We are currently testing, providing them files so authors can easily opt into Overdrive and control their books and allow, you know, I want this one in, I don't want that one in. And we're really excited and looking forward to making that a possibility. So it's yet another way that authors can say, yep, I'd like to be in the library system. Please help me. Fantastic. So that's, again, something that's on the cards for 2016. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's something that we're very, uh, very heavily engaged with, with the development team right now. And uh, I'm working really closely with my colleagues in Cleveland, which is where their head office is located. Yeah. And I think all these things are really important. You know, as we talked about at the beginning with Nook pulling back, I think it's really important that you guys are continuing to push things out and not just sit on what you've got, but just keep on pushing it. So the other thing that was uh, interesting um, is December 2015, Flipkart. India closed their ebook store and handed their customers over to Kobo, um, which is brilliant. And especially given, and again, coming back to Nook, Nook UK handed their customers to Sainsbury's, which if people don't know about Britain, Sainsbury's is a supermarket. They sell, you know, groceries. Um, It is not a bookstore. So I don't know how that happened. But anyway, let's go back to India. Um, Tell us about, you know, do you know why that happened? Are you excited about India? How can authors kind of take advantage of that so uh i mean the 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 partnership with flipkart is not all that different than the partnership we have with retailers globally flipkart wanted to focus on print and therefore 
our focus on ebooks worked really, really well so that the customers who, who had ebooks on Flipkart would not be disappointed and can still return to their libraries and still enjoy probably even a better e reading experience than they had previously. But then that also opens up yet another market within India, which we know is a growing market, is continuing to grow. And so I think uh, just in um, the the launch of the of the global pricing tools, w- which we've been working on for a while and had to keep going back to the user experience and how not to confuse it, is Rupees is going to be huge and Rand and Real and uh, they all start with R apparently all the new <laughs> currencies, but these are in gr- glowing global markets in Brazil and in in South South Africa uh, and 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 obviously in India. So, and in India you really 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 need to price low. Because mm-hmm. books are so cheap, print books are so cheap in India, you need to be bargain basement price in India. Almost, I mean, more so than in the UK, where where mm-hmm. big publishers are pricing low. So, and it's funny, I've got uh, a gentleman um, that uh, recently interviewed me for his podcast for, for indie uh, authors from India. Is um, he's writing an article for us from from the perspective of consumers in India and what are the best prices in different territories. And we'll be publishing that to coincide with the new tools so we can say, okay, here are your tools, Mm -hmm. but we've only ever really offered sort of English market pricing advice. How are we going to help authors with their global pricing? So great, we've got India now. Here's some ideas and strategies for you in India. And then we're going to be doing that in other territories as well. Because again, if we don't help authors, if we don't help educate them on how to exploit the global market and get new customers. Um, I mean, if we don't help them, we're not helping ourselves. Mm. I actually think uh, it's one of the things that, I mean, an iBooks is very clunky to to go direct to, but they do have this tier function so that you can see if you put in a price, it will say, well, this is actually tier 12 in this country. Like when I price in euros, for example, euros is in a lot of different countries and the tier, it'll say, well, in Lithuania, you're, you've just priced at 299 euros, but that tier is like tier eight. I'm just making this up. But, um, you know, whereas in Switzerland, it might only be a tier five. So you actually get that idea of, of the pricing for the 51 different um, currencies that they use <laughs> which, which can be overwhelming it right? it is overwhelming definitely and I think that this is why many authors go I don't want to think about that because many authors haven't necessarily traveled as much as as you and you and I have um, you know I've been to India several times and you can get print books for 150 rupees um, and you know at the moment most authors ebooks are going to be around you know 300 to 600 rupees no one's going to buy those so exactly yeah so I but I think going with the discounted price people have to remember that India is going to be about volume all of this is about volume at the end of the right. day so I think that's super important it's also going to be important like I've um, had emails from readers uh, in Africa who use Kobo uh, shop on Kobo because of the DRM free um, yeah. stuff and again they are buying indie books because the exchange rate means that they can't necessarily afford traditionally published books and yet I right. you know and I know you, you're not bringing out prices you know for like Nigeria and Zambia and stuff but you know that fast forward four years five years it may be that you do have that going on as you know as we know as the internet rolls out and everything um but that's i think that's super exciting so, so so part of me part of me wants to just stop talking about global pricing because there are <laughs> going to be authors like you and me and very small select group of authors that pay attention to this that will be at the forefront of the of the of the boom and part of me wants to say yeah okay just stick in your US price and go away go away um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. um but i can't because i see such potential there and i can't shut up about it mm. because uh, like you i'm very very passionate about about how different countries around the world are discovering ebooks for the first time, and that demographic, the you know the three-digit percent that we used to see in 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 North America and in the UK years ago, we're now starting to see that growth in other territories. So I think it really does it does make sense, especially since most you know the complaint I get is. Well, you know, 80% of my sales or 90% of my sales are Kindle. Yeah, but they're probably also in the U.S. In the US. And, and the U.K. What what percentage of your sales in different countries are Kobo, are iBooks, are the other platforms? And start paying attention not just to unit sales, but to the money that you're actually making. Because when you actually look at it in detail, 
um, sometimes that, um, you know, your units are all exciting and everything, but it doesn't put food on your table. It doesn't ensure that you can quit your day job and actually live on your writing. Uh, and, and those are things that uh, you can properly uh, exploit in the global market. Mm. Um, you know, and like you said, in, in India, it's a volume game, definitely. You, you're, you're not going to sell anything at the high prices. At least you're going to make some income from India and based on the population of English speaking readers in that country it could be twice what your US sales are if you play your cards right exactly and again it doesn't cost you anything to just well you don't even have to check any extra boxes uh you know it, it, it'll happen automatically but um yeah and of course you know I'm always going on about my Kobo map and uh having sold books in 74 of your 190 territories one of my goals of course is to sell a book in in 190 countries I'm gonna have to work on that We'll have to work on that together. We should work on that together. Yes, exactly. (laughs) We should. You know, like some people like travel to all these places. I just want to sell books there. But it's, um, you know, as I think, again, Michael Tamlin said, uh, the sales of e-books are between 20 and 30 percent of the market. So sure, that leaves 70 to 80 percent of print. But if you think that the percentage sales of digital in Brazil and India and Nigeria, big it, growing economies are 0.0001% right now. What is it going to look like when they're 20 to 30% in every single country? And, wow. you know, I think the problem that people have is that they can't imagine that other countries are like their country. <laughs> They, they think people, people are different. People are people. Yeah, exactly. No. People are people. And that's what it comes down to at the end of the day. I don't think it's going to be any different. It's just that, yes, sure, it's very difficult when you look at, you know, your earnings and you've made $3. <laughs> but you you have to think further ahead, right? You know, yeah, what, exactly. what, was Kobo even happening five years ago? Were we alive? We were known as short covers back then, I think, potentially. Um, I have to go look at a map because it's. Uh, I've been with Kobo since 2011. I think Kobo was two at the time. I can't mm. do math in my head yeah. very quickly. But if you, so I think, I we think... were either just just starting. Yeah, exactly. Just starting. And then if you go back 10 years ago, you know, th- there was none of this. So I think that keeping that longer term perspective, we always harp on about it, but people love us harping on about it. <laughs> They do. They do. We sound like old people saying in my day. No, but I mean, I I self-published my first book more than 10 years ago, back when all of my writer friends said, do not self-publish. It's the best way to kill your career. And for me, it actually helped grow my career. Mm-hmm. Um, so that, that, that was just, and that was, you know, like, well, Sonny, that was back in the old days of 2004. <laughs> so it was one of those, like it was what, that's 12 years ago now. But so much has changed in that in that time, and mm. so many new opportunities have have grown. There's going to be more opportunities if we keep our eyes on them. Yeah, and just uh, one final thing on this: if people have sold their rights to a publisher, the important thing is: have you only sold rights in the U.S. or Canada or the U.K.? Because when you publish on Kobo and the other platforms, you can choose to opt out of markets. So you oh, can. For sure. So this is the thing: so maybe you have sold Huge. your rights in. Canada but you can still self-publish in every other territory and I think that's people have to remember that it's you know don't sell world English Uh, that's crazy you know and we haven't even got time to talk about translation but we'll have you back on the show Mark you're (laughs) it's always a pleasure Joanna (laughs) it is so um tell us where can people find Kobo Writing Life and of course where can they find you as an author online so uh, it's Kobo.com slash writing life, or I prefer to send people to KoboWritingLife.com because we do have articles about craft and business of writing uh, at Kobo Writing Life on Twitter, and you can email writing life at Kobo.com. So, for example, those who are interested in the promotions tab, email us at writing life at Kobo.com. We will actually look at your books, and if we think you're ready <laughs> to, to help us test this out, We'll be honest with you and we'll say, you know, maybe, maybe not. Um, that might be some constructive criticism to say, well, we're probably going to reject your title because the covers aren't that good <laughs> or something like And it's, it's hard to be really diplomatic and nice, but to say, listen, it's not going to be a good experience for either one of us, so we're not going to do this. Um, and, and, and I'm at Mark Leslie on Twitter and MarkLeslie.ca on, is my author website. Fantastic. Thanks so much for your time, Mark. That was great. Thanks, Joanna.